Let's continue. In chapter 16, Cervantes masterfully narrates the chaos experienced by a group of people who spend the night at the novel's second inn. The episode anticipates by more than three centuries the intricate slapstick films of directors like Charlie Chaplin and Blake Edwards. First, the narrator reiterates the allusions to Christianity in the previous chapter, reminding us that Don Quixote arrives lying across the ass, and then characterizing the innkeeper's wife as someone who was naturally charitable and felt deeply the calamities of others. Is this sarcasm or an indication of the appreciation that Cervantes had for the bourgeoisie of the time? While the innkeeper's wife attends to Don Quixote, the narrator tells us that two very different girls assist her. One is her daughter, who is a very good-looking lass. The other, an Asturian servant girl, who has a broad face, a flat back of the head, a blunt nose, one blind eye, and the other eye not very healthy. This contrast between the daughter and the servant girl will unleash the confusion that follows. We need only keep in mind Don Quixote's desire for Adonza Lorenzo, and perhaps his own niece, which makes him something of a viejo verde, or a dirty old man. The night's chaos revolves around the fact that Maritornes, the Asturian servant girl, has a rendezvous with a mule driver sleeping in the same attic as Don Quixote and Sancho. The poor quality of the accursed bed offered to Don Quixote adds to the parody of the romantic encounter that our crazy knight has in mind. Note that Cervantes gives us a brief prelude to the sexuality of the episode when the innkeeper's wife questions Sancho's explanation of Don Quixote's wounds, saying that they seemed more the result of blows than a fall. Sancho insists that his master fell, but then he has to explain his own wounds as resulting from the shock that I felt at seeing my master fall. At this point, the daughter says she has had a similar experience. Many times I have dreamed that I am falling out of a tower, but I never reach the ground. And when I awake, I find myself bruised and sore as if I had truly fallen. It's easy to imagine Cervantes influencing Freud's theories about dreams and sexuality. Sancho then talks to this maiden about his master, whom he describes as an adventurous knight, who, although today he might be the most miserable creature in the world, next morning he would have two or three crowns of kingdoms to give to his squire. At this, Don Quixote suddenly gives the innkeeper's wife one of his typical speeches about the life of a knight errant. Believe me, my fair lady, you can call yourself fortunate for having hosted my person in this your castle. But he ends his speech by opening the door to the changeability of his own carnal desires. On the one hand, he claims he is enslaved by the ungrateful eyes of Dulcinea, but then he says that he wishes that those of the beauteous damsel of this castle were the lords of my freedom. This last detail, together with the appointment between the mule driver and Maritornes, who that night would frolic together, gives us the basis for the chaos that follows. By the way, the verb frolic, refocilarse, is the same one used in reference to Rocinante's carnal desire for the mares of the previous episode. One of the most sophisticated passages of the novel is about to begin, but in a wonderful way, Cervantes pauses to tell us that the original author of the story makes particular mention of the mule driver in this episode, and some even say that he was his distant relative. Ha! What a coincidence, right? The second narrator often questions the intentions of the Arab author, but here he asserts that Fide Mahamete Benengeli was a very attentive and very precise historian in all things, and this can be clearly seen regarding those that are mentioned here, which, although trivial and unimportant, he was unwilling to pass over in silence. What lies before us is a narrative feat almost cinematic in its effect. It begins with a description of Don Quixote fantasizing, his eyes wide open like a jackrabbit. Then, the narrator describes the wondrous quiet of the place. The entire inn was silent, and there was no light aside from a lamp that hung gleaming over the front door. According to his madness, Don Quixote believes the innkeeper's daughter was the daughter of the lord of the castle, who, overcome by his gallantry, had fallen in love with him, 
and had promised that night, despite her parents, a furto de sus padres, to come lie down with him for a while. This is the free indirect style. The narrator's voice phonetically signals the thoughts of Don Quixote. And Don Quixote is most worried by the perilous risk which was about to confront his virtue. And he proposed in his heart to commit no treason against his lady Dulcinea of Toboso. The episode is funny, not only due to Don Quixote's hallucinations, but also because his behavior is in stark contrast to his alleged loyalty to Dulcinea. Once Maritornes enters the room, our Hidalgo threw out his arms to receive his beauteous maiden. He grabbed her firmly by the wrist and pulling her toward him, she not daring to speak a word, he sat her down on the bed. We should note how Don Quixote's imagination makes Maritornes increasingly exotic, transforming her burlap into the finest and most delicate gauze, some glass beads into precious oriental pearls, and her hair, which was something of a horse's mane, into lucid strands of Arabian gold. Holding her tightly, too tightly, Freud would say, Don Quixote proclaims his loyalty to Dulcinea. Even if my desire wished to satisfy yours, it would be impossible. As this is happening, the mule driver gets jealous. Jealousy again. Total chaos now erupts in the end. The mule driver smashes Don Quixote. Maritornes falls on top of Sancho and they beat each other. The landlord comes in and everyone sets to hitting everyone else with such fury that there was not a second's respite. To top things off, the innkeeper's lamp goes out and everyone is left in the dark, swinging about with such fury that everything they touched got whacked. It's like a scene from the Three Stooges. And in the midst of this chaos, the novel's first lawman appears, an officer of the old Holy Brotherhood of Toledo. Known as a cuadrillero, he grabs his staff, a symbol of his authority, enters the room and shouts, everyone stop in the name of the law. Everyone slithers away, but when the officer encounters Don Quixote frozen stiff and lying on his back, he believes that our Hidalgo has been murdered. And Cervantes' narrative briefly wavers between a burlesque comedy and a detective novel. Lock the door to the inn. Nobody leaves, for they have just killed a man. 